All right, welcome everybody to the first official Rational Reminder community webinar. I'm Angelica, I'm the one that's usually behind the scenes, but I have the great honor to introduce uh, our three panelists for today. So we have Cameron Passmore, Ben Felix, and Wes Gray. And with that, I'll just pass it off. Thanks, Angelica. I don't think that Cameron and I are panelists today. I think we're just gonna listen to, uh, <laughs> to Wes. Yeah, I think Wes, like we, we, we sent you a, a pretty comprehensive list of, of questions that was sourced from the community. And I think as you know, Wes, yeah. because you've been in the community a bit, we discuss your thinking and, uh, and ideas extensively. So we're, we're thrilled to have you here. Um, but if you want to jump in to the, to the questions, I think we can just have a, we can have a nice meaty conversation. Yeah, th that's what I was going to do. Like, th this is not a, like a pre-planned or rehearsed lecture at all. I just, I'm literally going to go through all the questions uh, that the community sent and just try my best to, uh, you know, hit the wave tops and like have a conversation on each of them. It, and hopefully, you know, the end state is, you know, everyone learns a little bit more or, or maybe you're more confused afterwards, and uh, <laughs> which hopefully is not the case. Uh, but that, that'll be the idea. So I'm, I'm just going to start powering through uh, all these questions that the community sent, which, you know, God bless you guys for creating this community because it's the most robust set of geeked out questions I've probably ever received uh, from one <laughs> venue. So, so this is definitely a special community, I would say, versus pretty much all others that are out there. Um, so, you know, good on you guys for, you know, creating this, uh, this thing. Someone said on my Twitter feed, I put it out. They said, what did they say? Factor nerds unite or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I mean, I, 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 me personally, just so everyone has a background, I'm in the middle of a move, and which, which is why I don't know if you can see me in the background. I got a ladder because I'm having to fix an air conditioner here. Um, so I've been a little bit preoccupied with life. Um, but um, it, it was actually good for me to get on this and, and focus down. So if I say something crazy, that's my excuse. I've been... <laughs> fixing air conditioners in the background. Um, so, so anyways, one thing I like to do, just because maybe not everyone is familiar with like kind of what our impact mission is and what we're all about, I just start with the high level of what the heck is Alpha Architect, because Alpha Architect is not just West Gray, right? I didn't call it Gray Capital for a reason. Um, and, and we like to think that like, what is our why or why we exist? And so we have an impact mission that or we seek to basically empower investors through education. So everything we do is meant to fulfill that mission statement. It, the mission statement is not make money and create AQR, or DFA, and be a billionaire. It, it generally is empower investors through education. So that's what we focus on. And then we also have four core beliefs about how we go about our business. And if we're ever not sticking to these beliefs, uh, you know, make sure you throw a rock at us because we're getting off mission. And, and our beliefs are transparency. Uh, we want people to understand exactly why we do what we do and how we do it. Um, we, are, we try our best to be evidence-based, which just means we're trying to seek intellectual truth. And obviously evidence-based, unfortunately nowadays, is, is kind of a loaded term. But, but the intent there is, is we want to you know, seek intellectual truth and try to do the right thing based on our collective um, insight that we think we have into like the global mass of uh, data and analytics out there. Uh, we are systematic. Uh, I'm a recovering stock picking alcoholic and gave that up. So everything we do is systems based. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of people input, but we, we never do ad hoc uh, maneuvers, basically. Um, then our other our final core belief, which is kind of silly, but up in Canada, you guys would appreciate this. Win-win uh, focus. So everyone in the financial service industry has a bad rap for good reason. The history of our industry is basically screwing people, where you know the asset manager might win, the distribution people might win, but the client loses, or maybe the client wins but no one else wins. And and it's it's very difficult to make sure that all parties have a win-win because the asset managers need to be profitable. The advisors need to be profitable. The clients need to be making um, returns after fee after taxes versus what they could do by just buying Vanguard, et cetera. So those are just your core beliefs. Um, and then again, what do we try to do in the marketplace? Like what is our quote unquote value proposition? We call it affordable alpha. And obviously alpha is also a loaded term, 
But the concept is we want to try to deliver super boutique, unique, weird stuff that is not super scalable affordably. Um, so everything we do in our, in our business design and our culture and all of that is really meant to vanguardize things that Vanguard, frankly, can't vanguardize because they're too damn big or too bureaucratic. That's what we try to do. Um, and then a few disclaimers before I start. I'm sorry for this long uh, set the, the table. Um, you know, we do not claim to have all the answers or know everything. Like, I have a PhD, but I just become convinced over time that if you have a PhD, it's really just insight into the fact that you actually don't know anything. Because the more you know and more you learn, the more you confuse yourself. So I'm not here to mm -hmm. tell you what I have to say is God's word about the markets. Um, so just that disclaimer. And then the other thing I want to emphasize is we are a boutique not an institution. So by design, everything we do is super niche and almost also by design, it can't be for everyone. We are not trying to become AQR or DFA or iShares. There's, that's not in the business plan. It, it's not my personal utility function. I don't need to be a billionaire. We are a boutique. It, it, and so just Take that also with a grain of salt. We're not trying to say that everyone should do alpha architect stuff, right? It's frankly, it's not even appropriate for probably 90% of the investing public. And that's fine because, because again, we're not trying to be iShares here. So anyways, that's all the, the boring stuff up front. I'll, any, any questions on that, uh, Ben or Cameron or, or. No, I think that's a, that's a great yeah. pre preamble Wes, and, cool. uh, one of the amazing things about the Alpha Architect website where you guys express so many ideas is that you also express ideas that are totally counter to a lot of the things that you uh, yourself might say or that you do in portfolios. And that that yes. open discussion is is amazing. It's one of the most amazing things about the way that you guys communicate. Yeah. And, and that's also why I thought it would make sense to have Jack come on here separately because we even internally don't agree on half the things uh, <laughs> we discuss. <laughs> Um, and that's also why we have Swedra right for us and a bunch of others. Like, again, our mission is empower investors through education, not jam our way of doing things down people's throats. Um, so, yeah, it's really just an open exploration into all ideas. And you will never, ever hear me say this is the right way to do something because I'm just of the opinion that there's costs and benefits and trade offs to everything, uh, unfortunately. Um, so. Anyways, first question, and I'm just, I'm reading a document here so I can keep track of uh, all the great questions everyone sent. And so I'll paraphrase the question. So the question, the first topic was on concentration versus diversification. And the question that was asked uh, was, can you talk us through the arguments against holding concentrated factor portfolios? And so essentially I, I boiled the, the key arguments against concentrated factor portfolios really into three components. Um, the biggest one is, is probably the most obvious one, and that's the behavioral issues associated with relative performance chasing. So obviously, as you make a portfolio move away from the construction of a market cap index, so you sector neutralize, industry neutralize, factor neutralize, and basically recreate like a Vanguard fund, and then at the margin, you take small little bets, um, you're obviously not going to differ that much from an index. And obviously, the more that you kind of like let the reins off and, and, and go anywhere, obviously, you're going to be very different than an index. Um, and that's not necessarily a good or a bad thing, but in the sense that it's guaranteeing that you're going to make extra benefits or returns. But it's certainly the case that when you're very different, you're going to be up and down and all around. And, and to the extent that clients or investors, it's, it's costly for them to have too much deviation, either on the positive side or negative side. Obviously, contrary to factor portfolios are terrible uh, for, for that particular situation. Um, the other issue with concentrated portfolios is they're not designed, kind of related to that first point, to be standalone investments. It's super important that they get deployed in the context of a global diversified multi-asset portfolio, i.e. 
commodities, bonds, presumably you're not just all in on value, you've got momentum or other things, and your global equity book, right? Because no one should or could or would just buy a concentrated value portfolio in the U.S. stock market. Like, you could do that, but the concept of, of concentrated factors is you're, you're buying leveraged access to a factor which is going to help you with expected returns, but the trade-off is a whole bunch of volatility and craziness. So if that's not, you know, swept into a larger portfolio where a lot of like the randomness and idiosyncratic elements are, are washed away, you know, you're just going to be eating a high expected return, you know, straight vol portfolio, which, you know, and, and there's also arguments to do that, like Warren Buffett might be one. But that's definitely a reason or, or something to be con, uh, considered. If you don't own a, a truly diversified global multi-asset, high conviction is just all in is not going to work. Um, and then the other issue with high conviction is it's a high conviction bet on whatever you're betting on, right? So if you're betting on a factor or a set of characteristics, obviously the harder you own that characteristic and the, and the portfolio has a 10 PE versus a 20 and the market's at a 21, obviously you're, you're betting on that in a harder way. So if you're wrong, because you know God only knows if value is going to work or momentum is going to work or whatever they come up with next is going to work. No one can guarantee that anything is going to work. Obviously, um, you're just taking a bigger bet per per unit dollar expended in a high conviction factor portfolio. Whereas if it's wrong, you know you can't lean on on the just the generic market beta component. Um, of course, on the flip side of that, if if market beta stinks. Um, you know, and, and one of the factor characteristics is better, obviously, there'd be that trade-off. But, you know, so there's just basic behavioral issues. It can't be deployed as a silo, and you're taking a bigger bet on a factor and less on market beta, which is a, you know, two, double-edged sword. Um, so those are all the reasons that concentrated factors are just, frankly, a terrible idea. Um, and so then the next follow-up question, which is a good one, is okay. Okay, that's why concentration sucks. Um, Wes, can, can we can we just yeah. go back for a second on sure. on your your second point there? Yeah. About needing to be deployed in a globally diversified multi-asset portfolio. Um, yeah. This is some that one of the things that that comes up in the community a lot is like, can we just have concentrated value and concentrated momentum, and that's it? But it sounds like you're saying that those should be deployed alongside global beta and other asset classes. Sorry, so you can do uh, on the equity side, but it, you, you usually want to pool. Basically, in my opinion, equity broadly is short volatility bet, right? So you need to pool other things that are basically long vol, which would be, you know, uh, you know, managed future, like trend following managed futures that are built for crisis alpha, direct long vol bets, like buying put options or what have you. I, you know, and, and you guys do like, um, you know, commodity carry, uh, bonds are also unique. So it's fine in your equity book. I think that's probably diversified enough. But in the end, like, you, you just want to buoy these things with, with a global portfolio that, that has a lot of unique stuff that's not just stocks. But I do think that as long as you got like probably, you know, 100, 200 securities around the globe, and they're not all in on one kind of core factor. And obviously we're biased, but we like value momentum because we think they're structurally different. But if you said, hey, I want to do some, you know, small cap, I want to do some betting it's beta, low vol, that, that'd be cool too. And that's just enhancing it at the margin. You, you just, the main point I mean is you can't be 100% in U.S. concentrated value. Okay. Because, you, you know, it, that might be not so bad if you're in uh, like a U.S. value fund, like like say a DFA fund that owns like a core fund, well, it owns all 500 stocks anyways with some tilts. Right. You know that would be one thing. But if I'm in a 50 stock deep value U.S. fund, like that would kind of be stupid, right? Because you know you're, you're leaving some diversification on the table. So you probably should go global. You should probably do other factors. You should also pull it. it with other stuff. Um, is really what I'm saying. Because there yeah. are people, um, and, and you guys probably know this from dealing with clients, is, is home bias is a real thing. And, and even us, we have to always tell people like, hey, you know, 
putting 10% of your equity book in like developed international markets and 90% in US stocks, you know, that's not really a great idea. Um, so that, that's why, but, but people will ask us that all the time. Like, oh, I just own QVAL, I'm all in. And I'm like, well, well you, know, you got anything else in there, man? Like, I don't even do that. Like, even me, I do global diversified value. Better. Th that's what I mean. You, you, it's not, it's super dangerous. Like, it's that's just a common sense point. If you, you can't just buy something that's super concentrated in, in one bet, you know, that would be stupid. Um, whereas buying a closet index would be kind of protecting yourself from stupidity, which is a lot of times people do need that, uh, is what I mean there. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So if someone does concentrated U S value, concentrated international value, concentrated momentum, international and U S that, that ends up being a pretty good portfolio. Yeah. And, and, and we can get in arguments at the margin, like, well, do we need EM? You know, I'm of the opinion that if you have like commodities, you got commodity carry all in managed futures, you probably don't need EM because it's a lot of times it's tax efficient, super expensive. And it seems like a bad, it seems like a lottery stock when you look at the long-term profile on it. But, but you know, people can say, well, I don't believe you because I think they're different. They got China in there. It's, it, you know, I could buy that argument too, but those are kind of like marginal arguments of, you know, where we can arm wrestle over the weeds on that. Um, yep. But yeah, generally global diversified multi-factor, the contrary portfolios obviously have to be deployed in that context at the margin versus a just buying an S&P 500 fund. Um, and even that obviously should be, you know, put in a global diversified, but at the margin, it, that would be less dangerous than just buying like QVAL, obviously, um, and making that your whole thing is, is, is the point. Um, oh, yeah. that, that was a great discussion for that, uh, for that first question. Yeah. Um, and then, so, so the next question related to that is, okay, these are all the reasons why this sucks. Um, how could you fix this or, or why might it be superior? And, and basically my, my response to this is that's kind of the problem with concentration, like behavioral issues that that's just baked in the cake. Um, so, so unless you can get your clients or even yourself as an individual to think in like a global portfolio structure, like kind of think how you're supposed to via portfolio theory, where you're not supposed to pay attention to every single line, in your portfolio and like look at its sharp ratio and how it did relative to the benchmark every day. The reality is that's what everyone is going to do and will always do for the rest of time. So I can't fix that problem with concentration. It's, it just is what it is. Um, and then on the issue of, you know, uh, making sure this is deployed in like in a diversified context, Again, that's an education thing, but if people got strong home bias or they don't like how, you know, Asian people look, so they don't want to invest in emerging markets and like all the other crazy things people believe in, can't solve that question either. So maybe you wouldn't do a concentrated portfolio because, you know, Jim Bob just only buys American made. Fine. We're going to own VTI and call it a day and move on in life. Um, and then on the third thing, which is, the other issue with, with conviction is, is conviction. Basically, you're, you're betting hard on this factor characteristic. And if it doesn't work, you're totally screwed. Well, I can't fix that either, right? It's like, it, 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 that's just what, the, that's the risk reward you're taking. And if you're taking more of it per dollar or per dollar deployed, if it works well, well, it's gonna work really well. If it works terribly, it's gonna work terribly. And that's more of like, how do you, <clears throat> size your bet in your portfolio to make sure that you're risk managing in an appropriate way for your unique situation. So all the issues with concentration are just issues. Hmm. It is what it is. Um, so any, anything there? No, I think that's, that's a really, a really good insight. Yeah. And okay. And then, so the next question is, is well, all these are really good questions. So I'm not going to keep saying these are really good questions, but so it says, <laughs> we spoke with Brad Cornell recently. And he suggested that due to potential non-stationary effects on the relationship between characteristics and the cross-section of returns, in other words, we can't be sure that we are measuring the right stuff to build our factor portfolios, concentration is dangerous. Um, so at a high level, I agree. And then so what I wrote here is some notes. So for me, when, when I think about 
investing, it, it really is more art than science. And quant to me is a tool to minimize my monkey brain from interfering with the concept after the fact, right? But I don't, uh, you know, so I, I'm a huge believer that strategies and systems should be designed by me thinking way too hard about this, really engaged in thinking through financial economics, incentives, and psychology of people, and not just doing the pure quant route. Where, whereas if you're just a pure quant, and I used to hang out with a lot of these people in the PhD lab at Chicago, is, you know, I'd ask them like, because I used to trade stocks and, and be a, you know, like a stock alcoholic, 100% of them had never even traded a stock before besides me. So, you know, I, I, I remember vividly sitting in Chicago there and like a bunch of famous people now because it's been, you know, 20 years. They're all like fancy folks at, at the shops. But I, back in the day, it was like Daytech and TD Ameritrade was like the, the broker platforms. Yeah. And I used to like, you know, trade stocks all day in there. And like none of them even knew what like a limit order was. They never actually interfaced with Marketplace. And so when, when you're just pure quant, pure data, you're always going to end up with a solution that's going to have 500 factors, super optimized on sharp ratio, very complex. No one's going to understand really what's going on. And it's going to be awesome. It's going to like impress all your peers when you publish it in the peer reviewed journals, blah, blah, blah. But unfortunately, when we look at the out of sample performance of what they built, and we compare it back to brain dead, simple concept idea, time and time again, we always see that you got to the exact same place with 10 times the complexity. And the best example of that is old school Ben Graham, right? So Ben Graham, and I wrote about this in one of our earlier books, but, but he has this article he wrote in FAJ, or it actually was a medical journal, um, where he outlines the most basic deep value strategy ever. It's like, hey, you know, buy 20 stocks that have the cheapest PE and make sure their debt to, ratio, debt to equity ratios are under 50% or something. And then he has this crazy back test from like the 20s up to 1972. And it makes, you know, 15% annualized return and the volatility is, you know, jaw dropping, like 25% or 20%. And then so what we said is like, well, let's just do that simple brain dead strategy by contrade low PE with some stupid like quality check, like, you know, debt to equity ratio and do 72 to 2013. And you literally get the exact same result. 15% annualized return and the most insane jaw dropping volatility and relative performance you've ever seen in your life. And all this is, is basically one signal buy, you know, top decile cheap. Um, and it works in sample, out of sample. We don't got to argue about when book to market was measured. It, it just, it works. Um, and, and you see this in all strategies. Take the most complex thing, and we used to do this all the time, keep making things more, 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 more complex. And then <laughs> when you just compare them in a genuine comparison to like something that's pretty simple and captures the same ideas, you end up in the exact same place. Um, and so it's not really about optimizing on the exact measure or the exact detail um, of like, like, do we want to do a composite or, or we want to do this or that? It's really about what signals are you using? And hold on a sec. Uh, sorry, I got people bugging me right now for some reason. Um, it, it's really about thinking through what are your signals currently and what are they trying to do? And so in the end, what we try to do, and I'm not saying this is the right way, is we believe that characteristics proxy in the end for risk and or mispricing. And I, I know this is a DF, DFA-centric crowd, but more and more the evidence, I think, is becoming clear. And I don't know if you guys have read the Robico, uh, like long-term factor investing study where they actually at the end, you know, they go all the way back to 1800, do this massive data collection for out of sample to try to understand, you know, the reality of factors. Um, what they conclude is that risk is actually not, you can't find any evidence that risk drives factors. In the end, it's all really seems to be mispricing. So 
and that's just something to be aware of. Like I've always been trained that it's all risk and mispricing, and I've always thought it was both. But more and more, I think it does. It is reflective of mispricing. We just had a comment from Alex who said we are a factor centered crowd only not a dimensional centric crowd so yeah okay cool yeah but I, I just want to make sure that uh i just don't want to offend anybody uh you know with saying something and and getting yelled at uh <laughs> um but so, so and, and I'm, a, I'm just highlighting that i am a believer also in the risk thing because that, that was my my training and I, and I now also believe in mispricing but interesting enough, more and more evidence seems to be coming out when you look at like the long tail studies that are genuinely out of sample, that it's, it's hard to, to say that risk really drives factor premiums, frankly. It, it does seem to be mispricing. And I, I was just highlighting that when we go into this discussion about, well, how do you measure this or that or the other thing? It, it really boils down to me, like the art versus the science of it. And for value, which I inherently believe is just a fear trade, you're exploiting mispricing associated with bad sentiment, like baby got thrown out with the bathwater problems. Whatever you use to measure that, and I think that measurement needs to measure some fundamental to some price, because market prices relative to some fundamental generally tell what the market thinks about the fear gauge on this particular exactly. security, will work. Um, and we can argue forever about the best way to do that, and we probably will. And then momentum, in my opinion, is a greed trade in the end, right? It's, it's also based on how do I exploit people that love to performance chase and believe in rainbows, and that's fine, but we just want to front run that. Um, so whatever measurement you want to use that you believe helps proxy for things that look like shiny objects and, and people want to, you know, play with even further in the future, that's a great measurement. And the specifics of those measurements, I'm not so sure matter that much. Like you want to do 12 month momentum, you want to do 11.5 month momentum, you want to do nine month momentum, whatever, as long as it's in the ballpark of being capturing the open secrets, which is, hey, intermediate term momentum works, they're all going to be in the same spot. What I wouldn't recommend, though, is, for example, in momentum, we're going to look at two month momentum and that we're going to equal weight every momentum measure from one month to, you know, 30 month. Because maybe it's the case that, you know, different momentum measures like in the short run momentum or like the five year momentum aren't capturing like the fact that we want to find a momentum measure where when Dum Dum pulls up their Schwab account and they look at the one year chart and the thing is ripping and it looks like a straight line, that's probably gonna capture the type of crazy stocks that we wanna focus on if we wanna front run idiots. Whereas maybe the five year chart is less important, right? So whatever your measure, as long as it's grounded in what you believe you know, you're trying to exploit, whether it's risk or mispricing or some combination of both, that's what's most important uh, in my mind. And less about, you know, the, the nuanced specifics of how you go about it, if, if that makes any sense. Um, totally makes can, sense. We can argue about minutia till the cats come home. Do, do you think that uh, the, what, what seems to be an increase in individual investors doing crazy stuff like the Schwab guy you just mentioned trading on the straight line? Yeah. Uh, if, if that increases based on what you're just talking about, do you think that means we would expect higher factor premiums? I, I do. Um, I, I do think that the more crazies and the more fear and greed in the marketplace, obviously at the margin, the better for, for people like us who are using systematic approaches to basically exploit fear and greed. So uh, yeah, I'm pretty bullish uh, as more retail and, and emotionally driven investors obviously enter the marketplace. Um, but yeah, so for sure. Uh, but but that can wane over time, right? Like mar, mar, like someone told me a, a great analogy recently. You you enter markets where people value things like Rembrandt paintings, and then sometimes you're in markets where people actually think about fundamentals and cash flows. Clearly, we're in a Rembrandt uh, market right now where it's art. Like you value it because you like Tesla and what they do and like their emotions or whatever. Like you don't actually look at the fundamentals. And I think actually this is a Munger Charlie Munger. Uh, uh, analogy here. And so I think factors probably work a lot better 
when you're in Rembrandt markets uh, as opposed to like cash flow markets, hmm. just because again, they're meant to exploit fear and greed in the end. And, and I'm starting to believe that more and more versus factors are there to capture risk premia. I, I just, the evidence doesn't seem to back that as much as it used to. So um, Wes, there's a comment there saying, does that yeah. mean you think markets are inefficient? I do. I, I think they're super competitive, i.e. I don't, it, we're, we're, if we define efficient as, as in the formal way that prices equal the DCF of all future cash flows, I either, you know, they're actually correct. I think that is definitely false. And all you have to do is look at GameStop or AMC or pretty much anything right now. Like no one can convince me with a straight face that, that those reflect market efficiency in the sense that prices equal fundamental value. But that, but just because prices aren't efficient, I want to make sure it's clear that I don't think that money grows on in trees in the market, right? Just because it's inefficient doesn't mean it's easy to beat the market. Just like it's not easy to take advantage of GameStop idiots and to go try to short the stock because you, you want to take a fundamental view because um, mm. you can obviously die and go bankrupt trying to do that. And herein lies why I think fundamentally, even though everyone knows about factors and any idiot can go do a momentum strategy or value strategy on their own, they're always going to work if, if you believe in fear and greed and you believe that it's costly to arbitrage idiots, which I fundamentally do believe. And I think that keeps getting reemphasized as we go through different market cycles and, and experience things like we are now. Um, I just think it's evergreen. Um, but not easy. So yeah, long story short, I don't think markets are efficient, but I do think they're yeah. competitive. If that makes any sense. That's, that's, a, that's a great statement. It's costly to arbitrage idiots. Yeah. It, but, <laughs> it might be the title of this yeah. whole presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Arbitrage <laughs> idiots, but just be warned that idiots can cost you a lot of pain and anguish. So it's a fairly compensated arbitrage trade. Um, just as you, you, you guys know, um, you know, being a value investor is kind of a long term arbitrage in some sense, because you're exploiting people that just, you know, bomb out things that fundamentally are probably worth more. But as you know, you have to endure 10 years of looking like an idiot and having everyone tell you you're stupid, you know, only until like the last, you know, six months to be I guess almost kind of proven like, hey, you know, it pays to stay, but it's just, it's very difficult. Um, but um, anyways, so yeah, we can have those conversations as we go, but I'll, I'll keep powering through here. Um, so an, another really important question that is pretty complex, but we'll simplify it is, what are your thoughts on concentration versus leverage in seeking higher expected returns? And so, Luckily, I used to teach, uh, you know, fundamental portfolio theory and the, the, the whole efficient frontier. And the idea with portfolio theory is we want to pull a bunch of things together um, that have expected returns and different costs and benefits to try to maximize our sharp ratio. And, and when you do the efficient frontier, you, you get this thing when you try to maximize a sharp ratio collectively with all the available assets out there and the specific weights that, that you need to buy in order to achieve a maximal sharp ratio, you get this thing called the tangency portfolio. And this is the quote unquote, optimal global market portfolio. And then what you do with that global market portfolio, if you want to earn higher returns or earn lower returns, is if you want to earn higher returns, you leverage that optimal portfolio to juice, you know, juice yourself up the curve. But as long as you have a really good sharp ratio, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because if I, if I have a 10% return and a 10% vol, and I want to get a 20% return and a 20% vol, well, instead of buying one of S's crazy things that's just going to like screw up my vol, I'll just use I'll just use a bunch of leverage and leverage a you know one sharp ratio to achieve that twenty percent return twenty percent vol right so so that's kind of like how the theory works um, but it, of course the theory has embedded assumptions and really the key one is that you need to use leverage like sharp sharp ratio focused investing 
in order to achieve outcomes that, that have higher expected return needs, like you have a 20 year you know, uh, financial goal, really what you wanna do there is you wanna have high expected returns because you have a capacity to bear the risk that, and hopefully get rewarded for those high expected returns. But you know, if I didn't have to do that and I could just leverage a high sharp ratio fund, that's even better because I can get the high returns, but I don't have to eat the excess vault but you need the leverage. And unfortunately, leverage is a mark to market concept that comes out through the financial structure and capital markets. And why is that a problem? Well, the problem with that is leverage is fundamentally 100% correlated with the capital market status. And if the shit is hitting the fan, all of a sudden, magically, the cost to leverage, the access to leverage, and everything about mark to market leverage bombs out, which is why seemingly um, alternative exposures that have nothing to do with each other, people have to always relearn, oh my God, my multi-strat alt fund, why is it losing money in 08? Why is it losing money in March? I'll tell you why. AQR can't run six time leverage on long and short. They can now only run two times because Goldman Sachs prime brokers is talked to the risk management committee and they said, pull down exposure or the bank's going under. And so the problem with leverage in trying to exploit factors and getting excess return is unless you have a way to capture non mark to market leverage, like maybe like a Buffett does or some unique uh, capital structure, it's, it's just a dangerous way to achieve high expected return outcomes where concentration is bad because it gives you extra vol and it may not be the exact optimal sharp ratio at all times, but it gives you access because it's in, giving you implicit leverage to this factor, which implicitly is going to juice your expected returns, which means you kind of get organic leverage. And so it's not um, efficient in a sharp ratio sense, but it's efficient in a reality sense, assuming you don't have unlimited leverage that is, doesn't have regime dependent access. Um, so does, it, does that make yeah. any sense? Uh, that was a great, it's like a super that was, complicated. That was a great uh, answer. Yeah, you answered that really well, Wes. I think that, and, was, a, that was good. And usually what I also tell people, and this is a fundamental issue with sharp ratio thinking and efficient frontier thinking, is how does that world think about the just basic regime world of their short volatility, i.e. things that kind of make money most of the time, but then they get destroyed. And then there's long volatility, things that totally suck, never make money. But when the shit hits the fan, they go up, right? So. The problem with sharp ratio thinking or efficient frontier thinking is it doesn't really know how to handle like a long ball, like, like a put selling, a put buying strategy, right? It's always going to think that put buying is the worst idea on the planet earth or trend following dumbest idea on the planet earth. But fundamentally when we pair something that's got a huge, like expect a return, but also a huge short volatility bet, i.e. If the world blows up, this thing is dying. Um, what people don't realize, you can form portfolios where the individual components might have terrible sharp ratios, but when you combine these two things together, it's a magical situation. I.e., take something that has high expected return, crazy volatility, and the sharp ratio is horrific, but it's very unique. And then pull that with something that is pure long vol, like, you know, super tight crisis, uh, like trend fall managed futures, or like I said, tail risk insurance that, that kind of has horrific sharp ratio as well. But when we pull these together, it can actually create <clears throat> kind of this barbell portfolio that might allow you to achieve financial outcomes that are very favorable, but they also requ require deep portfolio thinking and not line item thinking. And I think you guys probably know this, but like even Bill Sharp himself said, the Sharp ratio should never even be mentioned outside of analyses of a true globally diversified multi-asset, multi-everything portfolio, because it's really about thinking about the global portfolio is a composite mm -hmm. and, and people use Sharp ratio to assess individual strategies, which it's just crazy to me. Um, 
So anyways, that's just some additional thoughts on, on how to think about portfolio construction. Um, how important do you think it is, Wes, to have something like managed futures if you're going to go with a concentrated portfolio? I mean, I think if you're going with any short volatility bet, i.e. stocks, like as we all know, you can own global stocks, U.S. stocks, EM stocks, value stocks, beta, whatever it is. In the end, if the world blows up, you're dead, right? That's because it's really in the end, it's a short volatility bet. And that's even more so when you do concentrated portfolios because you're just more levered to different kind of short vol bets. So any portfolio, I am of the opinion that you should really think deeply about tail risk insurance and long volatility type bets. Mm -hmm. um, and even more so, obviously, in the context of things like, cause in my mind, concentrated factors are just more levered into short vol, right? Just more deep into the equity trade and that's fine. But, you know, so at the margin, if I have a concentrated equity book global versus that's also deep in factors versus something that's just kind of just beta, but it doesn't have like deep risk in, in factor as well, then obviously you, you don't need as much long vol to offset the, you know, the two sided bet basically. So it's just really about how you, how you construct your portfolio. Right. But, um, most people, as you, as you guys know, they're like, oh, I got my long vol. It's in my bonds. And it's like, you haven't read enough history. You only back test the last 30 years. Like, hello, like bonds, like 60, 40 portfolios have had 50, 60 percent real drawdowns. They are not a long volatility asset, save the recent 30 year experience for the U.S. based investor. But you, you really need to think deeply about what, what's your true long volatility hedge. And the answer is not treasuries, um, in, in my opinion. Like, that's, that's dangerous thinking, uh, I think. But, you know, everyone can disagree with that. Um, so I'll take, can we take that question, Ben, that just came in? It got voted up. Wes, would you say that factor investing is more short volatility than market cap investing? I, I, I do. Um, Mainly because it just think about fundamentally, like, let's just do value and momentum. Value is really a deep, and again, even though more and more the evidence seems to suggest that it's mispricing, um, mainly, I, like, let, I still believe what Fama taught me. I do think there's risk component. So if value is fundamentally, you're getting paid to exploit idiots that misprice fundamentals, but also because you're buying things that are fundamentally riskier, i.e., you know, an oil company versus Amazon or something like this. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, if, if you're, the short vol bet is like the world blows up, well, if the world blows up and you're in a global market cap S&P or let's say VT fund, um, you kind of own a little bit of everything and that's going to be blended with things that might be more adaptable or less prone to like a market blow up. Whereas if you're deep concentrated value and you're now kind of levered in to like an additional bet on like true fundamental risk in an economy, well, when the world blows up, things don't get better for these types of situations, right? Like value firms that are more tied to the fundamentals and, and the risk of like assets in place or however you want to think about it, you know, it's just, they're going to be more exposed. Uh, in the end, I think. Um, and then momentum is a sentiment trade. But, like, I don't believe it's a risk-based trade. It's a sentiment trade. Well, if, if you're long a sentiment trade and the world blows up, you know, there's probably not going to be a lot of fanfare for momentum. And those things could just blow up even harder, arguably, and in expectation, even though empirically that may not be true at the margin because we could data mine out anything. But just high-level you know, I, I just think factors are just presenting a different risk that also is essentially in the end, I'm talking long only components. If you long short them, you know, maybe we could, we could have more nuanced things, but I do think long value, long momentum on top of beta, they're, they're giving you levered exposure to different risk, but unfortunately they're still short vol, um, I think. And you could argue just to, to argue against myself on the value side, this old Ben Graham argument, is, it, is if you're doing deep, deep value investing and you're buying a dollar for 50 cents, well, if the world blows up and now, you know, you, at some point, like now you can buy the dollar for 30 cents, but 
there, there's there's some sort of fundamental barrier where in the end, if you have a dollar in the bank and, and the thing's currently valued at 30, well, why don't we just liquidate this and make money? So, so arguably in deep, deep risk markets, in deep, deep value where you buy with a ton of margin of safety, you might have a, a hedge against deep short vol because um, you just liquidate the thing and you know take the cash and put it back in your pocket and make the spread. But I think in general, unless you're thinking through the old Ben Graham arguments of uh, you know current asset type arbitrage, they're probably going to be short vol. Um, hmm. But but I don't know. I think it, that's a great question. But I think it's safe to say that you know, they're not going to hedge your book. Like being in factors is probably not going to, if the world blows up, I don't think you're going to get crisis alpha from having, you know, momentum or value exposure is, would be a safe uh, assumption, I would say. So I'll go to the, the next one here. Mm -hmm. um, so it says, why isn't everyone a concentrated systematic value investor? Uh, well, it goes back to behavior, and, and this is simple, right? Invest, if, to, to the extent investors think in silos, and they think about line item thinking, and they just can't prevent themselves from uh, being concerned about relative performance chasing, it's just the behavioral risk of just quitting when, when the goings got tough and forgetting all the baseline statistics and what we already know about, you know, you got to go through five, ten-year periods of hell and anguish. Um, that, that's just going to expose you to a big risk. And so I just really think these are open secrets that are really hard to stick to. It's just that simple. Uh, and, and I always use the analogy of dieting and like getting in shape. Like you want to lose weight, PT more and eat less McDonald's. It's that easy. You will lose weight. But yet there's a million diet plans. There's a million schemes about how to optimize it, overcomplicate it. I, I think in the analogy to the financial markets is you want to make a lot of money over the long haul by concentrated factor portfolios, diversified, minimize tax, minimize fees, have a 20 year horizon. It's like PT more, eat less crap. The problem is that advice is like pretty simple, but it sucks. And everyone knows what you got to do, but who wants to do that, right? It, it's too crazy. Um, so I, I don't think you're insane if you, if you can't do a concentrated value strategy. It's because you're taking on a, something that is incredibly difficult and requires too much discipline, um, basically. So moving on, uh, another great question here, and this one we could go on for hours. But it says, which value characteristics? What are the advantages of EBIT uh, to enterprise value versus book to market versus operating profits, et cetera, et cetera? Um, assuming, and then the, the follow on question is assuming similar, similar levels of concentration, how different would you expect a portfolio optimized to EBIT to TV to look from one optimized for book to market plus uh, operating profitability? And so I'm just going to step back on this and talk high level. I think anything that measures and represents earnings power is good. So on the fundamental component, if that is a decent reflection of actual earnings power, that's probably a good measure for the fundamental. And then the price is very easy because it's transparent. Like, you know, it's either an enterprise value or an add back debt because you're thinking about buying the whole enterprise. Or if you're just thinking about net income, you can just focus just on the equity piece. The, the understanding of the market price is pretty straightforward, but we do get a lot of arguments and discussions about, well, what about the fundamental? And as we all know, book is one form of measuring a fundamental, but the challenge with book, with that, without requiring back testing, but just thinking through the financial economics of it, is once we step outside the realm of a bank or insurance company, where, where book is obviously measured much more high frequency and does represent like potential earnings power, is, is everyone kind of knows from a common sense standpoint, book is not a great way to measure earning power because you can have a ton of book and be losing your ass in the marketplace. Like energy companies have this all the time, right? Book value is amazing and you're losing more money than God. Where 
whether you want to do earnings, operating profits, where you add back this or that. We like operating income, which is EBIT, just because it's revenue minus cost of goods sold minus SG&A. It's just like what any business owner would think is like, okay, that's what the thing earned after paying the baseline cost. It's just simple um, is why I personally like it. But if you like cash flows or gross profits or any of these things, guess what? In the end, when you form portfolios on any one of these or any collective of these, they're always going to be 90% correlated. If you're buying portfolios, and we look at this all the time, on say EBIT the TV, which we focus on because we think the story and the communication is simplest to people that are business focused, our portfolios will also always be in the 95th percentile and higher on earnings to price, on cash flow to price, on all the other fancier measures. The one area where it's not clear is on book. So, so the way we construct portfolios is again, the fundamental is meant to how do we capture earnings power and we just don't use book in that process because I frankly just can't get past, you know, the argument that it's, that it's a good way to represent earnings power. And maybe that's just me. Um, so our, our portfolios will always look good on anything related to, you know, nor income statement or, or cash flow statement measures of fundamentals, but it can sometimes look good on book. It can sometimes look crappy on book. Right now, it looks crappy on book, but great on everything else. But I'm fine with that, right? Because I don't care about book value. I care about measures that I believe reflect actual earnings power of a firm because I want to look at the fundamental versus the price and try to get those that are the cheapest because I believe that, you know, the baby probably got thrown out with the bathwater on average. And I probably am taking a little bit extra risk. So is, does that make any sense on that question? I, I want to dig a little bit more into it. Yeah. So if, if we it. just look at book, um, yeah. I, I get it. They're going to look different. Yeah. If mm -hmm. we're looking at book, like what, what Dimensional does and what Avantas do, yeah. um, if you look at book and profitability together, does that start yeah. to look something like EBIT over TV? Yes, it, it, it does. Um, and, and, and if you think through the, the, like, think through like the mechanics of the portfolio formation. So the problem, and this is really um, a great opportunity right now, because we're, we're in a marketplace right now where, where book, high book to market firms happen to be in to totally garbage, right? So if you just do a straight, let's just buy the top 5% cheapest on book. If you actually look at the earnings, they're going to be great, like incredibly negative. So what book does, if you don't cure books element of this problem, where it can sometimes accidentally buy total junk that doesn't even make any money. So how could it possibly value, be a value play? You need to add back a way to get quality back in the measure to prevent it from doing this. Where fundamentally, if I'm sorting securities on earnings to price, EBIT the price, gross profits to price, whatever, by construction, it has quality built in because in order to be ranked high on any of these, you have to make money. And, and so if you're making money, that's just a baseline indicator for quality. So if you're going to anchor on book, because that's your legacy story, the only way to get around this problem is you got to pull quality back in or, or otherwise you have this danger of just buying junk. And, and so book to market plus quality is basically now all of a sudden going to be a lot more related and pretty equivalent to just using the income statement things because they already have quality in some sense, embedded in there organically. Th does that make any sense? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so so I have no problem with that. And, and I, if, if that's, again, I have no problem with any approach, frankly. And if, and if people really believe in book to market plus quality, which which obviously it was a good addition to, to fix the problem with it, and they've done that, and that's something that your clients believe in, you believe in, and that helped you stick to the program when this thing sucks, great. Um, you know, you don't need to do our, our version because in the end, our version doesn't matter. What matters is discipline and sticking with the program. That is the 95% solution we got to solve for. The 5% is like the nuance of, well, what does Wes say? What does, you know, Milena say? Uh, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, what is the client or the investor going to stick with is what, is what really is key. Um, right.
So this is actually a really good question here because we're we always have to um, unconfuse people. So do you think it's worthwhile to pursue to pursue value within the small cap universe? Um, so a, as everyone is probably aware, because this is factor geekdom, is there's a lot of new research from you know AQR, uh, Robico, a lot of people um, where where if you just say, hey, all else equal is size a rewarded factor does it make any sense i think when you're doing a, a, a intellectual assessment of like the the total research size is not a, a very um compelling investment factor um what is a compelling investment factor is characteristics that we know and love buy cheap stuff buy high momentum stuff and so i always pose this um solution or this this question people we have two stocks there's one stock is a 10 PE stock, so dirt ball cheap stock, and it has a $500 billion market cap. Or I have a situation where I have a 15 PE stock, so kind of cheap, but not as cheap as a 10 PE stock, but it has a $500 million market cap. Now, in the end, what am I gonna buy? I'm gonna focus on cheapness, because I believe uh, fundamentally and intuitively and empirically, that what drives expected returns in the end, all else equal, is the cheapness characteristic, not the size characteristic. And so to the extent that we jam ourselves into a morning star kind of style box component, really what we want to do is buy cheapness wherever it resides. What we don't want to do is incorporate size into this decision because if cheapness happens to reside in the mega caps, that are, because everyone hates you know, the, the old narrative you, you guys probably remember was in the like not that long ago, probably 20, 30 years ago, is oh, you need small caps. That's where all the growth is. They're nimble, they're more efficient, they get things done, they're more entrepreneurial. And now we're back to a narrative, and this always goes in cycles where no, you need to be huge, you need to be bureaucratic because you got fixed costs, you got scalability, blah, blah, blah. Like I've heard this story, it always comes in waves. Right now, obviously, mega caps are overpriced small caps have been destroyed. So it's not the size bet I want, but the fact that there's cheaper stocks in small caps means I want to probably own smaller stocks because that's where cheapness lives. But I also want to make sure that my investment strategy, if all of a sudden that changes and now mega caps, no one likes those because they're the losers, they're slow, they're dinosaurs, they can't adapt. And that's where cheapness resides. I'll go on the mega caps. I want to own cheapest, highest quality, independent of size in the end. And I do not want to constrain myself to having a size as like a critical component of what I'm doing um, that, it, it, as, a, as a high level philosophy. That, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. W and, would, you, and, would you measure expected, so I guess we're just, you're saying we would only measure expected returns based on cheapness and size basically doesn't play into that. Yes, and what happens is, and what the, all the papers have shown, is that the, the issue, which is not an issue, is that cheapness is generally tends to be correlated with smaller, right? So, so there, most of the time, the cheapest, highest quality securities are not in mega cap world, because arguably the, at the margin, they're probably more efficiently priced. But it's so yeah. on average, like smallness, or, or sorry, uh, cheapness and quality is in those market caps, but not all the time. And so like from a, like a process standpoint, it, it, this is just, again, our philosophy because we don't care about Morningstar boxes because that's just not our business. We just care about making money. Um, we, we want to have size not be a constraint on what we fundamentally believe in is we want to buy the cheapest stuff that everyone hates that's the highest quality junk that everyone hates, right? Because we believe those are the most likely to have a mispricing component that over a long haul will be realized and we get to make some extra return. Happens to be they're usually in smaller mid cap things, but we want to make sure the process is allowed to move anywhere. Where what I don't want to do is constrain something where I have to be, you know, R2K market cap. And then what happens if everything in R2K, like that's not where the cheap stocks are, right? So, so as long as you have a way to, to monitor that, um, I think you're good because I think expected returns are driven by the cheapness characteristic in the end, not like 
not the size characteristic per se. Um, yeah, that's a really good way to, uh, to explain and, the answer to the question. We're going to make this clear because no one's written about this. Jack and I have been doing a bunch of research where we're, we need to, we just need to show this because because this is something we know because we've already done all these papers, but we can't possibly write up everything we do in blog posts because you know we only have so much time in a day. But but the basic idea is you can go empirically and and and, and make this clear to normal people and say, listen, like we can go form portfolios where where maybe the size is stayed static, but like there's different valuations within that. And we can highlight that it's the value characteristics, it's the cheapness that drives returns. It's not the, like it's once we control for that size does not add any value. And that's what all the papers have shown with like regressions and all the fancy like statistics. But no one actually understands that crap because this is basically what they've said. They said size controlling for all the other crap doesn't do anything. But we need to show that so investors can see that. Like, like we're like in a nice invest to grow chart or in like simple statistics. And, and so we're, we're working on that to, to try to make that more clear. But we're just we're basically just restating what, you know, Robico and AQR and all these guys have already said, just in a simpler uh, to digest way. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the other thing I want to add on this point, because this is this is a, a, a really important topic is, well, what do we do? So we look at top 1500. So we structurally do exactly what I just said we shouldn't do. Like in a vacuum, if I didn't have to focus on taxes and frictional costs, the, the ideal value investment strategy would be, I'm gonna take the universal securities, I don't care about size, and I'm gonna go look for the cheapest stuff out there. And then amongst that cheapest, say decile or, or whatever, top 20%, go for the highest quality. I'm going to buy those. I don't care about size. That's empirically what you should probably be doing. The problem with that is that obviously we operate ETFs and registered funds, right? And the issue is I'm trying to minimize tax. Well, guess what? You can't trade micro caps in an ETF and not expect to get fleeced and lose any possible benefit you could ever find, right? So we need to have, we need to constrain ourselves where I'm, I'm not in a just go anywhere optimization problem. I'm trying to deliver products that have some scalability, right? I can't just focus on under $5 million market caps because we could put, you know, my PA in the thing and we're already maxed out, right? So that's stupid. Um, I also need to deal with taxes, right? Because even in value strategies, low turnover, Uncle Sam's 50% carried interest is a way bigger deal than worrying about you know how we calculate the value factor we leverage the etf wrapper to solve that problem but the etf wrapper obviously has constraints you shouldn't you know trade micro caps in a etf wrapper so we've tried to we've tried to optimize as best we can to deliver a product that has some scale and is tax efficient fee efficient frictional cost efficient and this is where we kind of came up like, hey, that top 1500 kind of schmid cap and higher go anywhere is our optimization. But like right now, we're, we're, there, is, there was a lot more deep value, being completely honest, down in the under 1500, you know, like from, you know, down in like the 5,000, 4,000 range. Well, that's great, but, I, you know, you can't build an investment product that you want to run an ETF wrapper that goes and buys stocks that are like 50 bill market cap, right? It, 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 so I could do that, but then I give up the tax efficiency. Um, it, so, so basically what I'm saying is there's, there's always constraints in reality versus the theory, but all else equal, I, I, would not, I would be agnostic on size and I would focus on cheapness as a priority and quality as a priority and then size would be an afterthought. Um, is is a long winded way of answering that question. Can, can we come back on on micro caps in an ETF? You kind of lost me on yeah. uh, on on wh why why does that not work? Like I, when, when well yeah. So, so so here's what I would say. It's it's unclear, and this is also a deep argument in the marketplace right now for the following reason. So there, there's one hypothesis that okay. In, in an ETF, what we have to do is we have to rebalance and you have to disclose your portfolio every single day. So one approach 
would be, and I, I generally still believe in this approach. This is kind of like the old DFA, like, hey, our trading's better than your trading, or my trading's bigger than your trading type of thing. And the argument is like, listen, if I know I got to transition to a bunch of illiquid crap, like, I don't want to tell the marketplace because I want to cagely kind of like sneakily get access to this liquidity uh, before the market knows because otherwise they'll steal it from me, right? I don't want to get front run to death um, because implicitly I'm assuming I can get better execution quality by being not transparent than if I was totally transparent about it. Makes so sense. I, does, does that make sense? Is makes sense. The, yeah, so the front running argument. And then, so then, then just to tell you the other argument, which is, is a conflicted argument, but it's provided by the Ishers of the world, they take a different philosophy on this. They're like, no, we don't believe you. We actually think it's counterintuitive. We think you should actually tell the marketplace and yell as loud as you possibly can at the treetops about what you're gonna do, because what that's gonna do is attract competition from every single market maker and HFT on the planet who are then gonna compete like dogs to get the scraps to hmm. basically pre-package very efficiently liquidity to you. And that, that's actually a pretty compelling argument it, it, that I, and I just don't know the empirical answer, but it's basically one argument is I can get access to liquidity cheaper by being not transparent because I'm smarter than the HFT algos. The other argument is I'm not gonna ever be smarter than these people. Let's just let competition help us efficiently <laughs> prepackage liquidity and deliver it to our fund at the mark fair market rate. And, and this is right now like an argument, I think, in, in the marketplace of like product structuring and the theory, what is the better approach to go at? And, and the reason I say it's a conflicted argument is because iShares is huge. And so it's in their interest to tell everyone that, oh, we can launch a micro cap fund and don't even worry about the liquidity costs because we're letting the marketplace yeah. deliver it to us cheap because that's their only option, right? They're too big to not say that. And, and so, so that's what, I just don't know what the answer is. And the problem is like that theory is being portrayed by monsters where they have to use that argument because they can't even argue for the other one or it's, it's against their pitch. Yeah, um, totally. So, so, so and, and that's the, the re I mean, it is a compelling idea, but it's a conflicted argument. Which, which means it's hard for me to ascertain, like, is that true or not? Um, and I'm sure academics will be studying this and figuring it out, but, and we can also empirically look, because, you know, iShares has a micro cap ETF that buys some totally illiquid crap. Um, and so I'm sure, um, you know, people will start to get more and more data to assess, like, hey, we've got a mutual fund version that buys micro caps, like, you know, Bridgeway or, or something like that. And then we got iShares doing it. You know, th there's probably, if someone got the data, they could do the, they could figure out the impact cost and liquidity provision cost and, and actually empirically answer this. I just frankly don't know the answer, but that is the, the arguments that compete on both sides of uh, liquidity. Um, but Fascinating, uh, that, was a, that yeah. was a good deep dive in there. I like that. And, and, and again, the reason I, I made that statement that you were that you were pulling on of like, man, I want to be caught dead going down in micro caps. I personally still believe that it doesn't make sense to tell the street that I'm about to buy this like 300 percent of ADV in Joe's Chicken Shack, because I just know a lot of hedge fund people and market makers. And it, it, for me, I'm just. I'm just worried about that. And, and I, until there's more evidence in the marketplace that the iShares hypothesis is true, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to like just put a product out there that I got all my own money in where, okay, we're going to go down to like the top 5,000 and then, you know, we buy all these micro caps and we pay 10% in transactions costs and wow, that was stupid. Um, so I, I just don't have confidence to do that just yet. Um, right. So, but I could be convinced like, in the future, if you see if you see us move down into top three thousand names, that means that that you know someone convinced me that that after tax, after fees, you know, and after impact costs and trade execution costs, that it made sense on net to do that. But I'm not there yet, basically. Um, so net, next set of questions are: Have you made any changes to the quantitative value philosophy since writing your book? Um, so the the answer is yes. 
we, we, we made a bunch of changes, um, none of which have any, frankly, substance to like expect a return or any of that stuff. Uh, it was really changes, honestly, to simplify the systems. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'll give you a few examples. So in the old days, because we were never in the business of asset management, um, so we were still talking like, like academic people. So we used to have this thing where we said, hey, you know, for market cap cut, we do the 40 percentile on NICE breakpoints. Why do we do that? Well, you, everyone on here is a factory geek. You know that because if you go to Ken French's website and read any academic paper, that's how you think about breakpoints. Because when you back test, you, you know, it's nice to have like a dynamic thing that's based on a percentile break. So that's what we said. But of course, when you talk to any consumer and you say, they say, oh, what's your process? We're like, oh, well, stage one is is we, we first do a cut on, on all stocks above the 40% uh, breakpoint on NICE market caps. You just gotta go on French's website and you can download it. They're like, what are you talking about? Um, so we said, that's stupid. Um, let's talk to the marketing people. Hey Wes, you're an idiot. Why don't you just say you're gonna buy the top 1500 on largest market cap? And I'm like, yeah, good idea. Um, so that was one type of change. <laughs> An another change we had is we have like literally three chapters or maybe four chapters in the book where, where we do all these negative screens, right? And, and they use like logistic regression models, which is like, you know, machine learning, but we, we never called it that. But nowadays they call it that. It's just super complicated crap that it, it's, it works, it's great, but trying to communicate to people like logistic regressions, like how they work, why they work, and how they predict like outliers it wasn't worth it. And guess what? Empirically, I can just negative screen on crappy momentum, crappy high beta, and a few other things and get to the exact same end state. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that our consumers and our clients understand like, oh, so your negative screen is you bomb out like the worst 10% on momentum, you bomb out the worst 10% on lottery stock characteristics. They're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. So even though we were effectively doing the exact same thing, but in, in arguably a more complicated kind of empirically verified way, it's just, why are we doing this? Like, like let's just simplify the communications and, and, and make it easier to understand. Um, and so that's all of our index changes were not changes, frankly, to the fundamental ethos of what we're trying to do. It was, how do we make it simpler to communicate so other people understand and can replicate and truly embrace what's going on because because we've just found that if other people understand explicitly what we're doing and could replicate it on their own at the margin they're way more likely to stick with it when it's quote unquote not working um whereas if i create some whiz bang chicago phd 500 math equation you know complex algorithm with like you know composite scores and like z you know in the end like i'll understand it but if my consumer or my investor or, or my client doesn't really know what the hell's going on and they haven't internalized that, it's going to not work. Because because when things are going great, they're going to be like, oh yeah, it's God, they got all that PhD mojo on it, like I'm in. But when it's not working, they're going to be like, oh, dude, these Chicago PhDs don't know shit. Like I'm going to go talk to these machine learning guys. They're way cooler because this this stuff is just fuddy duddy and too old school. They don't they haven't adapted. Right, because they can say that if there's a lot of complexity and they never really understood what they were doing. Um, so again, we're trying to get people to understand what we're doing better than we understand it, so they get endowment effect and they stick with it. Basically, that's a it, it's a good lead into the next question about the the family office that seated Alpha Architect in in 2012. And, yes, uh, and, and so the question there is a great we're, one. We're, um, just this, we have 15 minutes left, Angelica yeah. said. So we may want to try to rapid fire through as many as we can. Yeah, I'm going to rapid fire these for sure. So the family office that backed us, just to give everyone here context, they were seeders on hedge funds for 30 plus years. And they've been investors for a lot longer than that. So they have literally seen every cockamamie scheme that has ever even came to the street. And they have literally seeded the best, brightest, they were, they always uh, pride themselves on being the biggest fee payer on the street for 30 years. However, Reg FD and SAC blowing up and all the new regulatory environments that came out that said, hmm, you hedge fund people are cheating 
and you get access to information before everyone, we're going to eliminate all that. It, it became very clear that the old game of basically legally cheating and front running the rest of the world, those days are gone. We're now into like a transparent above board, you know, world. They needed to get out of that business. And, and so that's kind of, we helped them transition from, you know, cloak and dagger, smartest people in the room that basically just pay a lot of fees to get access to information before everyone. That business was dead. They need to move. So they're smarter than us, always have been. They're, they don't do performance chasing. They're literally like Warren Buffett type mentality. So, they, they, you know, the 10 year value drought, they're like, whatever, been there, done that, moving on um, type of mentality. So no issue. Um, so we'll move on to momentum here. What would you estimate as estimated training cost for someone implementing a quantitative momentum index? Or, or frankly, any kind of high frequency momentum index that, as everyone knows here, in order to capture those juicy, amazing expected returns that every academic documents related to momentum, the dirty secret is you're not going to get that rebounds in every six months and like having all kinds of like trade execution constraints on how much you can trade, right? You have to trade momentum to get momentum. And so that means it is entirely tied to frictional cost. And so when you ask me, what is the estimated trading cost? Well, it's going to depend on how much AUM you have and when you do your rebalancing. So we strategically time all of our rebalances after talking a lot of people on the street to when the big S&P 500 and MSCI rebalances go down. Because 99% of the yearly ADV for a lot of securities in the marketplace clear on these days. So to the extent that you want to get the fairest market price possible when there's the most liquidity that ever existed in the planet Earth, and you trade on basically S&P and MSCI rebalances, you can jam a ton of AUM into a lot of strategies and have minimal impact cost. And that's what we try to do as much as possible. But of course, it's limited. Like, and I have a thing down here. If, if you gave me $1 billion, doable. $5 billion, doable, but tougher. $10 billion, I'm gonna have to not do 50, I'm gonna do 100 names. I'm probably not gonna equal weight it, I'm probably gonna, Put a little kind of market cap waiting on it. You give me $20 billion, now I'm going to start being more like MTUM. You give me $50 billion, welcome to just firing me and going to buy a Vanguard fund because that's what I'm going to have to do, right? I'm going to basically redo VTI and never trade and do like literally nuanced trades around the margin. And unless I'm charging maybe just several basis points over uh, VTI, my, you know, my net value add versus my fee ain't going to cut it. That's just reality. Like everything has capacity and you can't put, you know, 10 pounds of stuff into a one inch hole. Um, so yeah, if we got that big and we charged big fees, I would just kind of go the other way. Um, right. So next thing mentioned here, um, given the previously mentioned noisy nature of estimating the relationship between characteristics and, okay, so basically factors are really noisy. We don't know if they're going to work, but the issue is the frictional cost are arguably to capture the momentum effect are much higher than those of say value. So let's just say value and momentum don't work. Your downside is, is arguably bigger with momentum because you just ate way more frictional cost, and you're like, ah, oh, that's stuck. Um, true. The issue though, is you also get way more compensated for the momentum factor. It, the, the momentum factor just generates a much bigger expected return premium versus value. So all else equal, probably because that's just, a lot of it's actually related to beta. Like for example, like the QMOM index has a beta of like 1.3. Um, so it's just, you know, it's kind of an apples to orange comparison, but to the extent that let's just say momentum is a total dirt ball and it's just delivering you leveraged exposure to beta, um, you know, it's going to have also two to three times the frictional cost, but it's also had a higher expected return embedded into it. So the net benefit of what you got, assuming momentum was dead, but you had leveraged beta exposure minus your frictional cost. I then need to compare that to what I just got through beta, because let's assume value was dead minus your frictional cost. It's unclear to me what, what that uh, trade-off is, frankly. Um, because I do believe that momentum 
fundamentally delivers a different beta exposure than usually value because value usually delivers either a one or lower uh, depending on how you construct it. So I don't know, but um, it, it's just it's a, it's a I don't know the answer. It's just but it's more complicated than a lot of people think. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, okay, this is a great one. Um, on a similar line of thinking, should investors be worried about the fact that momentum can offer, can often have negative loadings on price factors like profitability and value? So, so you're buying, let's say, a fake thing like momentum. Momentum, let's just pretend for argument's sake, is just dumb. It, do, it doesn't actually work. It was, it was data mining. It's what Fama said. It was just a crazy data artifact. Um, and, and now you're it, now you're betting against something that let's say was actually true in the end, which was value. Oh my God, that's that would be a terrible thing. Um, Hundred percent can't argue with that. It's it is what it is. So what the way I would answer this question is in general stepping back is you, I want to buy things that have high expected returns. And I, and I need to believe in them, right? So if you frankly do not believe in momentum and you think it is fake, that, that's just what your belief is, then you implicitly don't believe it generates high expect returns after frictional costs. So you should just shouldn't own it. I personally believe that value generates high expect returns and high vol. I also personally believe that momentum generates high expected returns and high volatility. And because I believe in both approaches, and I think they're both edged bets, and I believe that because they're different, I choose to pool them. And I'm totally comfortable with doing that because I fundamentally, fundamentally believe that both ideas are valid and, and have a chance to earn high expected returns and pooling them just helps on the risk management piece. But, you know, obviously maybe one breaks, the other one breaks. And, and I would strongly not recommend people do momentum if they just fundamentally do not believe that momentum will ever work in the future. Because then why would you own it? Because you're just negatively betting sometimes against the thing you really believe in. Um, it, it, you know, so, so that one's more just a faith-based thing. It's, it's hard to argue there. It's like either believe in momentum in the end or you don't. And if you don't, don't do it. I believe in it, so I do it. It's a perfect answer. It's obvious when you say it. If you don't believe in it, you wouldn't do it. I mean, it's that's, yeah, yeah. That's if you just don't believe in it, why the hell would you do something that sometimes <laughs> bets against your your own interest? Because you know, value you pay negative on that stupid thing. Like that's crazy. Um, yeah. So it's just a, it's a faith based decision, which in the end, what a lot of these things come down to. Mm -hmm. um, so another question, good one. Do momentum, no, do momentum investors need to get out of momentum if assets get close to estimated capacity? Um, I would say no, but your expectations need to change because that portfolio formation would have to be different. It's going to obviously generate less exposure to momentum. And unless the fees change, you're going to be net negative. So I, it, you, know, you could stick with it, but you need to change expectation and make sure that on after fee basis, the benefits are there. Otherwise you would want to sell it. Just like buying Berkshire Hathaway in 1965 is a very different bet than buying it in 2021 because Buffett has too much money and you shouldn't, that doesn't really necessarily mean you should sell Berkshire, but you should have a different expectation set of what can be achieved basically. Um, okay. I'm just going to blow through some things here, skip a few. So, so rebalancing, um, does it make sense to passively invest by tracking the index and active strategies like value and momentum? How do you decide on rebalancing frequency? Uh, do you think it's possible to tactically rebalance a factor portfolio? Um, what I would say is in the end, uh, a lot of people read a lot of academic papers and they don't consider the reality of the marketplace. And so what we do at Alpha Architect is our goal is after tax, after fee compounding. And, and in the end, I would love to be able to do a daily rebalance momentum fund because we've done the back test. And obviously that is the most whooping on amazing thing in the world. Like if I could just do a daily rebalance, no constraint, like 212 momentum fund, you're going to get, you know, 35% kegers and like, it's awesome. However, we can't do that. And we need to focus on after tax, after fee. And I need to play in the ETF sandbox to avoid tax problems. 
and I need to trade with people that charge me money. So our rebound, everything we think about with respect to rebalancing, structuring, and how we do it, it may appear as though it's suboptimal in some sense of a, like we could operate in a vacuum, but just be aware that we, again, we have all our money in our own products and we desire to deliver the best after tax, after fee outcome because we're also in these things. And so if we do stuff that quote unquote looks stupid or someone smart on Twitter says, oh, these guys are idiots. Why don't they do it like this? We don't disagree, but we have to consider reality. Um, and so that, that's my answer to that question. It's just, you unfortunately don't get to operate in a vacuum sometimes. Um, next question on ESG. Um, so everyone mentioned like, hey, you have this Twitter thread. Um, and, and the concept is, it was basically a counterintuitive way as if, if you want to earn excess returns and make sure companies uh, play better with society and are better at internalizing externalities, like we don't want people polluting our world because if there's smog in the air, we're all dead. So hey, Exxon, get your shit together, right? Um, that's awesome. Obviously, we all want that, but we, we also, for investing, we want to make money. So basically, the, the thesis was, is if you want to make excess returns and change Exxon, you're not going to achieve either goal by buying funds that buy firms that already check the box on ESG, right? Because if you buy firms that already transparently are doing well and doing the right things, well, guess what? That, that benefit is probably already priced in because they now have lower cost of capital because there's so many people that want to buy ESG stuff. And they've are, like the marginal benefit of getting them to change is not there because they're already in the ESG game. And so if you want to be a good ESG investor, you want to think through it as a lens of like a fundamental investor. Okay, I'm going to go buy actually the worst ESG companies on the planet because if I can somehow get them to change and move in the direction of being better and more friendly with ESG, one, I'm actually affecting real change to make them do the right thing, which is awesome from a societal standpoint. And oh, by the way, if I can get them or if I can front run in, ahead of time and buy these when people don't perceive them as being very good ESG firms, and I know they're going to eventually become good ESG firms, this transition from dirt ball, high cost of capital, you know, Philip Morris to, oh my God, nice, clean, pretty, like energy efficient, whatever Philip Morris, now their cost of capital is low. And when, when you buy a security that has high cost of capital today and 10 years from now has low cost of capital, obviously you get to earn a, a, a return premium for that. So you get to earn excess returns and affect real change. So again, the summary is if you want to do well investment wise and do good society wise, do the opposite of what everyone does and go buy the worst ESG years and start yelling and fighting and trying to get them to change basically. Um, Love it. Yeah. Okay. And then there's a lot of questions about our stuff internally. I think we're running on time, right? So but should I just try to wrap are, up here? If you're willing, Wes, people are begging you to keep going. Yeah, no, I, I can keep going, man. I'm, I'm right, not. Just, uh, let's bring yeah, through the rest of these questions. They're, they're good. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go through them. So, so the next question was understanding West, Jack, and Alpha Architect, and then a bunch of questions about like our operations and how we, we think about things. So, first question is what is the most challenging part of running an ETF business? Um, I mean, so, so just so everyone knows, like I actually love our business. Like I, I don't really, I don't, I can't really talk bad about it because I actually just like it and I would do it for free anyways, probably. Um, don't tell anyone that, but I would. Um, so, but it, the, the challenging things for me personally is dealing with ops, compliance, legal, regulatory, because a lot of people probably know this, but when you're in the most regulated industry on the planet earth outside of probably healthcare, you know, 90% of your time is not thinking about research, doing education. It's like dealing with lawyers, dealing with boards, dealing with compliance crap where, hey guys, we're not stealing money from grandma. Like, I mean, what, how much do I need to reiterate this? But ever, all the regulators treat you like you're going to do that. So you just, that's the most challenging part is dealing mm -hmm. with that. And I'm sure Ben and Cameron can relate to this problem. Just um, a bit. 
What are you most excited about right now, research, uh, business-wise? Um, so, I mean, for us, like, I mean, our, our, like, everyone knows our stuff, probably the ETF side, like, our products and our ideas that are worth the dang are already out there in the market. They're going to be there for 20 years, and we're never going to probably launch another product. I'm just not that smart. Like, me personally, I believe in the value premium, and 20-year horizon is my money, so I build a product to capture that. I also believe in the momentum premium, and I got a long horizon. I don't care about tracking error. So, and I believe in global diversification. So we do value, we do momentum, we do it globally. I'm also a trend follower, personally. I know a lot of people hate that. So we have a trend following overlay. That's what we do, that's what we always do. We're always gonna fine tune it at the margin, think about ways to get it more efficient, like on our operational side, like cut a bit here on trading, or that, that kind of stuff is fun. Um, but then the other thing that's really exciting for us is actually less related to our own products because they're just there, they're doing their thing. And it's more related to our ability to affect change and allow other boutiques to enter the ETF marketplace. It, because it, historically, it's just so damn onerous to compete with iShares or Vanguard if you're a boutique and, and you want to try to do what we did. So, so we've kind of opened our uh, ETF platform and we're internally trying to rip out every cost imag imaginable because we want to basically help other people with new ideas that are boutique-y and they have kind of like traditionally what would be in a hedge fund or mutual fund. If we can somehow lower the cost of entry and, and bring new people to market that, are, that we think are, are going to be able to drive real value in the boutique space, you know, we want to do that. Um, so, so that business is really fun. And, and kind of the mission there is to help ETF preneurs, I call them, win. And, and so I, you know, I get excited about that because I just, you know, we have so many scars on our back in this damn business. It, it just feels good to be able to like help someone that's new, like the fresh face, you know, because we're kind of old and crusty and it's just like, oh man, someone who's still excited about this like crazy business like it's just refreshing and we just, it's a lot of fun to kind of help them basically. Um, so we get excited about that stuff. Um, you mentioned in the RR community, community that you and Jack have different opinions on a variety of things. Can you tell us about some of the big differences? So this is really, honestly, Jack and I's um, biggest differences are really in how to communicate things and how to make models like there's always this tension between, you know, how do we communicate and maybe oversimplifying it versus like, hey, here's the empirics on it, but it's going to add 10 layers of explain explaining to everyone. Like, do, do we do the hyper optimized thing that we want to do or do we do the thing that is easier to explain and communicate because people are going to sit in their seat? And, and so this is kind of always the tension, like the perfect answer or the behaviorally sound answer. And it's not that Jack or I, like, ha we're, like we sit on that side of the fence just in different contexts, but that's usually our arguments. Um, <laughs> it, they relate to things like that. Like, lower, this is too simple, but it's super easy to communicate, which is better because, you know, if you have the best mousetrap in the planet and no one understands it, no one's going to put a, a dollar of AUM in it, well, who cares? Like, which, you know, like, what, what's the point? Um, so, so we usually have arguments that relate to this. Um, How big is your team, Wes? Um, so we have, there's 11 of us uh, full time. And then the, the, we're, we're, it, right now we're in kind of like a hiring binge. So, so we're, we're looking for probably like five or six new people. Most of it's related to like operation and tech. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so... Our, our team is kind of lean because I don't like managing cats everywhere. What's so, your total AUM right now? Can you share? What's that? What's your AUM right now? Uh, so we are uh, about a billion and a half. So it's about 500 mil in our SMA business and then, you know, billion and change in our ETF complex. But like our stuff is around 600 and then the remainder is white labels. But we're launching like 10 new funds here by the end of the year. So... You know, it's, yeah, our e, that ETF business is getting huge. Um, and, and also our SMA business, it's not, not really a discussion for here, but, but we have this really weird, unique, super boutique, like direct indexing business in the tax space in ESOPs, 
which is like the most esoteric thing on the planet. And, and that business, you know, started the year probably like a 250 mil SMA business. And it very likely will be a billion dollars by the end of this year. Wow. It's crazy. So, so our just, yeah, our business is just like hitting on all cylinders. And, and our problem is we're, we got too much shit going on. And, and we're just trying to manage growth without breaking anything effectively. Um, so, I have another, yeah. I have another easy question for you yeah. from a listener. Uh, yeah. Watcher here. So, with the rise of retail investors, are we potentially yeah. going to see longer value droughts in the future? L longer value what? Droughts. D drought. Oh, like like beat downs on the different yeah. factors. Yes. So, so what I would say, in, like just out of sample for expectation management. And it's really related to mispricing and the, the idea that, you know, Keynes said, but it's not actually true. He said this, you know, markets can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. You know, i.e., if you're trying to exploit a sentiment driven factor, which I believe is value and momentum are both sentiment driven factors and sentiment is more pervasive in the marketplace, you should probably expect to go through deeper and more extensive pain trades on all of this stuff out of sample. Um, and, and that's because people have gotten crazier on one side. And I even think if they weren't crazy, if the market's more efficient from like a factor perspective, because there's too much money sloshing around in like the ETF world, like the way factors get efficient is, is they might deliver the same expected return over like long 20, 30 year cycles, but the volatility and their correlation with other crap, because there's too many people playing the same game, it's just going to get more painful to stick with them. Um, so I, I just say expect more pain. Yeah, just as a good expectation for the future. And um, James would like to know where will all the new people work? Yeah, well, a lot of our so so I, I actually moved down to Puerto Rico um, for tax reasons and just because it allows me to compartmentalize because I want to refocus on our impact missions and as you probably know, like if you're in the ops every day, like, and I like to program and like get in the weeds, but you know, the CEO probably shouldn't be like programming these days. Like, even though I like it, that's just not my highest and best use. So I'm out of there. And then also Jack is structurally working from home and then showing up to the office there just as needed for the same reason. We're just trying to be better at like doing HBU, like highest, best use. And and the PhDs just need to get out of the way of ops. Um, so, so our garage band basically has a lot more space and we wanna keep the garage band members in there who need to be in there. So like the training team is expanding and that's, a, that's something where you need people in person because there's a lot like live communication um, and a lot of noise. So, so we're actually pretty good um, on space. And then also just with COVID, you know, we, we found that there's a lot of things that it's just actually inefficient to be centralized to some extent because thinking, doing research, doing blogs, you know, like you need quiet and, and you can't have people bugging you all the time. So we, we've opened up slots uh, to be able to operate. And then, you know, if it gets any bigger, we might have to leave the garage and actually go get an office, um, which culturally is tough for us, not because obviously we can't afford it, but just you know, we, we like the mentality of, of being a boutique. So we'll, 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 we might have to change that in the future. Um, That's a big move so. for your family. Well, uh, sorry, say again? That's a big move for your family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, so I've always thought it was a good idea um, just growing up because I had a unique experience as a kid, like growing up on a, on a cattle ranch in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, and right now we, we live in like the burbs of Philly where everyone's rich, everyone's the same, everyone's got the same experience. So I thought, you know what, you know, I want to make sure that, that my kids had the same benefit as me of being exposed to like normal people and, and like kind of like, like the broad public out there. There's a bigger world than like the rich suburbs. Um, so I, did, I just thought that this, this would be like a good adventure and cultural experience because you guys probably know like Puerto Rico, like everyone speaks Spanish, like not everyone here is rich. Like, so I just thought it was great from a cultural standpoint. And then I just needed to rationalize that to by my constituents, which would be my, my wife. Um, and so it just so happens that there's, there's great tax incentives 
So, so now I can say, well, babe, hey, we're getting paid to go on an adventure and we, we get some of these like lifelong lessons and cultural influence benefits. And so it just makes the, the trade very easy. Um, and, you know, so, so we're going to give it a whirl, uh, you know, try to put in two or three years, almost like a, uh, what do they call it? exchange student? Like, yeah. I think they probably do that in Canada where you go live with the family in, you know, Africa or France or something for a couple of years. And then, then you come back. That's kind of what, what it is. It's like a deployment for my kids, basically, because um, they probably don't want to join the Marine. So I'm going to make them do the do, do something equivalent, though, is the, is the idea. Um, Wes, but, we uh, yeah. we skipped over the questions on factor momentum, and I know yeah. that's I'll, I'll hit that. Yep. I'll, I'll, eat, I'll hit that real quick because I just was concerned about being on your timeline. Yeah, but yeah. like I said, I'm, I'm I got nothing else to do. So we can ask, <laughs> you know, feel crazy. Um, it's just me at my house. I don't, my kids aren't here. So I, you know, I'm a bachelor. So I just work all the time now, um, which, which I haven't had that luxury in, you know, a long time. So we stay here till midnight. Um, so, so on the factor momentum stuff, um, and just to recap that like high level, the argument is like, Hey, really what drives momentum is not cross-section momentum and, and buying winners and, and selling losers. Really what it is, is, is momentum strategies are implicitly factor timing. Because because the, the cross-sectional momentum is really capturing like, oh, you should be in profitability right now. You should be in betting against beta right now or wh whatever it is. And then, and then what the, the argument is is that it's actually better to capture the premiums via just straight up factor timing. Where, whereas like doing cross-sectional momentum or relative strength is kind of a noisy way to get to that premium. Um, so what I would say is that having read all these papers and, and there's you know people have also studied this out of sample using like the gfd data to me globally that is an unclear argument i know there's the recent paper there that's that seems to suggest that you know timing long short factors is at the margin explains everything in relative strength momentum and then some there's other papers out there that do kind of more half-ass versions of getting to that, but it's very simple. And they say, oh, factor timing actually doesn't work at all. It doesn't explain anything. So, mm -hmm. so in my mind, when there's different research that you know, counteracts the other research and it's unclear, which is what happens most in empirical research, if you read enough papers, is, is there's kind of like a general concept like, hey, buy winners, buy things that look good on momentum and, and now everyone gets buried in the weeds of their camp of like, well, I think you should do it with factor timing. I think you should do it like stock picking. I, I don't know the right answer. For me personally, I behaviorally believe that again, momentum is a greed trade. And for me, it's just intuitive. Like if I see a bunch of stock charts and some of them are going up and nice and a bunch of other stock charts that are going down and dirt balls, I believe that it's the greed trade and that the greed players are gonna be focusing on these great stock charts. So cross-section momentum is just a way to exploit and front run these idiots. Um, factor momentum, I just, I can't like think of a story that I can write on a napkin. And if I can't explain something to my monkey self, cause I forgot all my PhD crap and I, you know, I can't prove black shoals anymore. Even though I used to be able to do that in my sleep. I, I just, I needed to be able to explain it on a napkin and cross-sectional relative strength momentum just makes sense to me. It's, it, whereas factor momentum, I understand like, okay, it's kind of getting to that indirectly, but I, I don't, I don't know. I just can't, I can't get my head around why it, 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 it's any better or any worse than just doing what I'm already doing. And I already understand what I'm doing now. So you know, if someone pitched me on it and, and said, hey, I can do this at low cost, you know, good taxes, and here's my process, I would say, great, like, let's do it. Um, I, I just have no strong opinions on which one is better. I think they're both fine, and they probably get to the same exact end state. I just am more comfortable intuitively with relative strength as a, as a process at, at the stock level. But, you know, that's just me. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. That's kind of been a thread through a lot of your answers, Wes, where it's like, if, if you believe in a thing, you should do it. And, and yes. if you don't, you shouldn't. Yeah, ex exactly. And, and um, it's really important that, like, that you understand what you're investing in and why. 
And it's less important that like, well, Fama said this, or, you know, Susie said this, or Wes said that, or Jack said that, or Ben said that, because those arguments are going to go on forever. Um, just like, hey, does God exist? How the hell are we ever going to know? Like, I personally think God probably exists, because how the hell else would all this stuff? It's just too crazy. But if someone said, well, I think God doesn't exist, I'd be like, well, great. We could just argue about this forever, but we're never going to actually get anywhere. <laughs> what do you believe in? And what do you think makes sense? And what can you stick with? And what makes you happy? Do that. Um, is, is kind of my ethos on all of these things. Um, yeah, it's, that's, you know. that's so good. I think that's, um, a, that's a good place to end, Wes. We, um, I, I've spent, you know, we spent two hours just now. I think I've probably spent maybe maybe six hours with you outside of this doing the same kind of thing, just talking yeah. through stuff. And for me, yeah. it's always been really impactful. And I've learned a ton from talking to you and Jack. And I, I, it's amazing how generous you guys are with your time. And uh, sharing that kind of experience with with the Rational Reminder community is kind of what I wanted to do here. And I, I think we I think we captured it um, really well. So we, we, we all very much appreciate your time, Wes. Yeah. And, and sorry about the, the chaos on the move and, and everything. Uh, I just, I apologize for that. It but, makes, uh, makes it real. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. My, my life's kind of crazy on the personal front. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and I just want to say like, and just reiterate, like, remember like our why mission is empower investors through education. So, I mean, even if you're broke and you got like a hundred bucks, but you know, you really love factors and you like to geek out, like we'll talk to anybody. And I'd rather talk to someone with a hundred dollars than the billionaire who just wants to tell me how their version's right and they're awesome and cool. Cause I'm just like, well, whatever, I don't care. Um, so yeah, anyone can reach out. You know, there's no, you know, we'll talk to anybody. Like, I don't care how rich you are. Cause that's not our mission to sell you our ETFs. Our mission is to empower investor education. Um, so yeah, I mean, just reach out anytime. That, that's what we do. Um, so someone just, com someone just commented in the, in the chat here that, they said everybody should run over to the Alpha Architect Reddit and simply get it going. Fill it up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, go crazy. <laughs> uh, but and the, and the only thing I, I like to remind, just to sell you guys something, is um, just because it, it's kind of like something I, I like to do, is, is we do this event called March for the Fallen in, in September. Um, where it, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not a fundraising thing. It's a, it's a direct consumer charity where, where we just go out there to represent for gold star families. Where if you're Canadian, that, that just means that like a family had their, their son or daughter uh, killed, killed in, in the service. Um, and, and you probably know, but like no, no parent should ever have to bury their child in any context. And so this is just an opportunity to kind of let them know that, that, you know, we're just, you know, respectful of their loss and, and we mourn with them and remember, uh, you know, their sacrifice. Um, and so that's in late September. Um, it's a great cause and, it, and it's awesome for that reason. But, but the other thing that I want to emphasize here is it's also a great live community event where, you know, anyone who's silly enough or dumb enough or crazy enough to show up to the middle of Pennsylvania uh, and do a 28 mile ruck march and geek out on all this shit that we've been talking about here for two hours, it's your peeps, right? And so I'm sure the <laughs> rational reminder community would be filled with people where this would be your jam. And so, so if anyone wants to represent, uh, you know, we float all the logistics on housing and, and all that kind of thing. You just got to show up and pay the 35 bucks. Um, so I encourage anyone who, who's interested, just, you know, mark your calendar for September 25th. And, and get a plane flight down there to either Philly or, or Harrisburg. And because uh, I think we're going to have a big, big event this year. And um, amazing. It's, it's kind of a great live event uh, thing we do. Yeah, that's very cool. If the, uh, if the borders are open, then I'm, I'm hoping I can check it out this year. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hopefully Canada uh, gets everything squared away on the whole COVID thing. Um, but uh, I think they will. I'm, I'm hopeful you, you guys will be good by September. Uh, as Iraqis say, inshallah, right? God willing. <laughs> so, um, great. Well, good all blast. good. Awesome, Wes. Thanks. Thanks again. This has been uh, been phenomenal, and I know everybody in the community is appreciated as well. Yeah. Yep. Appreciate your time. We'll, we'll see well. everyone later. All right, see Wes. You. Take care. All right. all right. See you guys.